Hi, uh, we're pleased to have Rose Yu here. Um, Dr. Yu is an assistant professor at UCSD, uh, just down the coast. Uh, she did her PhD at USC and then did a postdoc at Caltech, so definitely a Southern California representation. Her research focuses on advancing machine learning techniques for large-scale spatiotemporal data analysis with applications to sustainability, health, and physical sciences. A particular emphasis of her research is on physics-guided AI, which aims to integrate the first principles with data-driven models. Among her awards, she has won an NSF Career Award, a Faculty Research Award from JP Morgan, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Adobe. Several Best Paper Awards, Best Dissertation Award at USC, and she was nominated as one of the MIT Rising Stars in EECS. So uh, a warm welcome to Rose, and please uh, take it away. Okay, great. Um, let me share my screen. So, um, hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me to give a talk here. So, I'm assistant professor in UCSD, and I direct a spatial temporal machine learning lab. So, today I'm happy to share with you this relatively recent work about group on uh, meta learning dynamics forecasting with task inference. So just to provide some background motivation for this problem, in climate change, and it is very important to understand the Earth's climate and predict its future evolution. So this is perhaps one of the greatest scientific challenges of our time. And in climate science, fluid motion in the ocean or atmospheric dynamics can play a vital role in regulating the climate system. So as you can see here, we have the uh, fluid motion in the cloud, in the Wi-Fi, and also the, um, you know, the uh, ocean and even the hurricanes. So this uh, type of fluid motion generate massive simulation and real world data. This data opens up new opportunities for data science and, and machine learning. So in climate science, climate models are a set of uh, differential equations to describe how energy and matter transfer in different parts of the ocean, atmospheric, and land. So typically, um, to run a climate model, scientists need to specify different parameters like climate forcing, such as the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmospheric dynamics, or and then need to use very powerful computers to solve these mathematical equations in every grid cell. As you can see in this picture, we can discretize the entire Earth into a grid of small cells. Depending on the resolution of the cell, we can have a different amount of computational difficulties. So typically, when we run this type of climate model, let's say the cloud resolution model, the resolution we can reach now is about uh, 50 to 100 uh, kilometers. But uh, in order to understand the cloud dynamics, which constitute the changes in hurricane and other disastrous events, we need simulation models that can zoom in into a few hundred kilometers. So there you can see a huge challenge and opportunity for computer science, which is to develop faster models to have fine-grained resolution of climate simulation. So this is uh, one of the fundamental challenges in computer science or in rather climate science. So, and then another challenge is that in climate science, we don't have very good observations across scales. So we have uh, different devices from satellites to aircraft to uh, different observation boats. And these type of, um, uh, sensory devices so we call, can collect the data at a very different scale, but they only collect data at different parts of the Earth. So we don't have a full observation of data at the different small and fast scales. And on top of that, climate models have huge amount of uncertainty. And also they have such stubborn biases. So all this combined makes climate problems or climate modeling problems a very difficult task. So in today's talk, I want to focus on a specific task, which is dynamic forecasting. So our goal here is to develop a deep learning model that can emulate the behavior of a climate simulation. 
in particular, we want the steep surrogate model to perform forecasting that it can replace the forward steps in the climate simulation. So forecasting is a very classic problem in time series analysis. We're given observations from the past in black line. We wanted to predict the future observations in red line. And typically in climate applications, we have several thousands of these time series altogether collected from different cells of the grid. We wanted to predict these several thousands of time series simultaneously, leveraging their interactions. So uh, fundamentally, we can describe this type of uh, dynamic forecasting problem by a set of differential equations. So let's say we define the observations across all the time series at the time t as a state of the system xt. We assume the system is governed by some parameters. Let's call it phi. So a dynamical system can normally be described by a set of differential equations. And these equations are also the mathematical equations that was used to simulate climate dynamics in climate models. So we have the set of equations. Each of these equations can see has some terms in it, including the state of the system, xt, different orders of derivative, such as the velocity, the acceleration, et cetera. And then this equation is governed by some parameter phi. So the underlying dynamics here is governed by the equation, but unfortunately, due to lack of observation or inaccurate physics in the system, we don't have a good grasp of the exact equation that governs the climate dynamics. So what we wanted to do here is to learn a model or uh, we call it F that can predict the state evolution, the system evolution without accessing the exact equation that governs the system. So this model F, you can think about this as a neural network that maps a sequence of past states x0 to xt into a sequence of future states, xt plus 1 to xt. So the number of steps we're forecasting into the future is often known as a forecasting horizon. Because climate dynamics can be highly chaotic, so in the long term, if we forecast for a very long horizon, then it's unavoidably that type of forecasting model will diverge. But the goal here is to minimize the divergence of forecast, trying to minimize the forecasting error as much as possible. And we're training our model on a bunch of data generated by some simulator. And once the model is trained, it can replace the simulator and make predictions very quickly because the inference of deep neural networks is quite fast. So that, that's the whole level, that's a high, a high level idea of defining deep surrogate models to speed up complex climate simulation. Um, now in my group, we have been trying to address some of these challenges in forecasting uh, for physical science applications using a framework called physics guided AI. Because uh, the climate dynamics are governed by a lot of physical principles. So we don't want to throw these principles away. In physics, this is a discipline that has been used to describe space-time dynamics for hundreds of years. So they often design this first principle method using mathematical equations or other type of mathematical tools such as tensor networks or symmetry. So physics-based physics methods are very simple efficient because they are derived from human knowledge. So they can you know, describe the pattern without seeing much of the actual data, but they are expensive to compute and uh, they often need to make various assumptions on the underlying dynamics in order for um, the computation to be tractable. So because of these simplifications, physics guided, uh, physics based um, methods can also have inaccurate physics. Um, they can be quite far away from real world data. And on the other hand, we have machine learning methods which are statistical based methods. So we derive data-driven models using a different set of tools, such as graphical models, neural networks, or variational bias. So in machine learning, we derive model from data. So therefore the models are quite realistic. 
But unfortunately, we also need a lot of data to train. So machine learning models often have very high sample complexity. As an example, a typical reinforcement learning model to learn how to play a simple game of chess, it's not simple, but to play a game requires several millions of examples. And all, all, you know, often the case in scientific applications, we cannot afford to generate that many of data points. On top of that, machine learning models cannot guarantee the predictions are physically meaningful because they learn the statistical patterns from data. So it's very difficult to incorporate, say, conservation laws in these machine deep learning models. So the idea behind physics guided AI, this framework is trying to bridge these two fields together by leveraging the best of two worlds. We know that uh, you know, physics-based models are um, sample efficient and they can guarantee generalization in unseen domains. And we also know machine learning models are efficient computationally and uh, you know, we have uh, very realistic models. So we want to combine the best of two to learn very complex dynamics from a wide range of applications I use climate science as a motivating application. In our lab, we work with a wide range of applications from climate to epidemiology modeling, to transportation, to fluid dynamics. And we recently got into particle physics. So they have a wide range of applications. And after that, we wanted to generate interpretable predictions using physical knowledge. And fundamentally, we wanted to use this set of tools to assist decision-making in science and engineering and eventually make a real world impact. So this journey started out um, with this problem of accelerating turbulence simulation. Um, we were given a task from some of the engineering folks and the climate scientists to speed up the simulation of this type of turbulence. This turbulence is known as the René Bernard convection. So it really happens when the top fluid, the cold fluid on the top interacts with the warm fluid in the bottom. And when these two types of fluids of different temperatures interacting with each other, it creates this very complex turbulent behavior. This uh, turbulence is interesting to climate science because it resembles the El Nino behavior where the cold fluid in the North Hemisphere will interact with the warm fluid in the South Hemisphere. And that creates this phenomenon called El Nino. Um, simulating this video alone, even though it's only a few seconds, takes a few months. So our goal here is to speed up this simulation with a deep learning model. And we should have started out this research by building a model called Turbulent Flow Net or TFNet. This combines the idea from computational fluid dynamics with some ideas in multi-scale modeling. So the model works fine. It generates very physically meaningful predictions so you're, if you're familiar with turbulence modeling, you will look at this plot, see how the energy decays with different size of the waves or wave number in a turbulence. And then the solid line is the ground truth. We can see that the model using this hybrid approach, TFNet, can closely follow the ground truth energy spectrum of the simulation while speeding up the simulation of a numerical method by two folds. This is only on the two-dimensional flow. And later we did a follow-up work to speed up three-dimensional turbulence flow using a similar idea of physics-guided deep learning. And we were able to achieve 10,000, even 10, um, you know, 100,000 speed up. Um, so this is kind of a starting point of our journey to build deep surrogate models that can speed up complex simulation. And there has been a lot of fantastic work in that domain, building different types of deep learning models to speed up all kinds of simulation from turbulence to molecular dynamics to uh, epidemic simulation. But a common shortcoming short of this method is that they often train their models on a very specific type of dynamics into a specific type of fluid, in this case, a specific turbulence, specific type of uh, initial conditions or boundary conditions. And then when we wanted to simulate a dynamics of a different condition, these models will fail. And that leads to this generalization challenge. So I can show you a very simple example. 
where generalization challenge actually ha can happen for very simple task of forecasting. So we studied this phenomenon for dynamical systems where we are simulating a dynamical system governed by a sine function. So on the left plot, we can see that this is a very regular simple time series. And the goal here is again to do forecasting. We are given the observations on the left-hand side of this vertical line from time step zero to time step 30. We wanted to forecast the time series from time step 30 to time 6 to 60. So for sine dynamics, the parameter that govern the dynamics only have two of them. We one is the um, initial phase, the other one is a magnitude. So we call this parameter theta. In this experiment, we have a training parameter theta train and the testing parameter theta test. They're, come, they're drawn from the same interval A and B. So in practice, we would sample a bunch of values of the phase and uh, magnitude parameter from this interval, generate a bunch of sine functions, train the, our model on the set of train parameter and then test it on a different set of parameter. So these parameters are not the same, but they fall into the same interval. So there is um, no question that the model can learn to forecast accurately. However, when we change the experiment setting slightly, where in this case, the testing parameter is drawn, are drawn from a different interval, B and C. So now we're in the extrapolation region. The dynamics of the data have shifted from A and B to B and C. So in this case, it actually doesn't matter what models we use. We tried a lot of different models, transformer models, sequence to sequence models, or even the most state of our time series models. Uh, none of the models can forecast accurately in this case. So that implies a fundamental challenge in dynamics forecasting, which is generalization. The performance degrades significantly from training to testing. And uh, this basically posed a challenge here for all the deep surrogate models. Even though these deep surrogate models can work for the dynamics that they're trained on, they often fail when the dynamics shifted from training to testing. So the question we want to ask here is, is there any way that we can build a model that can react to these changes in the dynamics and then generalize well, even though the distribution of the dynamics have shifted? So the high, high level idea of this paper is to use some inductive bias from physics to improve the generalization of deep surrogate models. Okay, so before I proceed to this paper, and I want to check whether there's any questions on the chat or feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat or Q&A, but if anyone uh, has a burning question, that might be a good time. All right, so no questions. Okay, let's um, talk about our method. So our method here is called Benna Learning. It was published in NeurIPS last year. And uh, it was led by my PhD student, Ray. He's graduating this year. Um, so the problem setup is as follows. Let's say, let's say we have some turbulence dynamics on the top. And you can see that this turbulent dynamics is a very steady. It's a very, relatively steady turbulence. And then we train a deep learning model that can emulate the dynamics of the top turbulence well and to forecast the future evolution of this turbulence. And then in the testing phase, we have a very different type of turbulence. You can see that now this turbulence is very vibrant. We still want our model to do well. The question is how? So we want to build a model that can generalize to flows with very different buoyant forces. So buoyant force means this external force that can drive how turbulent the flows are. Um, and the, the key idea is to use inductive bias. In this case, we want to use time invariant symmetry in the latent space to figure out how these dynamics are related to each other. Um, the key insight here is that even though the parameters of this flow have changed a little bit, become more and more vibrant, they're actually from the same system. So there is this type of symmetry 
that are, that don't that doesn't change across the parameter regimes. And the point is to find them using deep learning models. So uh, in general, you know, our work is related to these two paradigms I'm learning. One is called meta multitask learning. The other one is meta learning. So in multitask learning, this is a simple example of how human learns, right? We train on we train on a bunch of uh, tasks, let's say uh, walking, hiking, riding horses, and then we can learn all the skills simultaneously and then eventually learn to perform in, in test environments. So you can see the tasks are exactly the same, but we might be performing them in a slightly different uh, environment. And then that's multitask learning. So a typical approach is to learn some sort of a shared representation among these tasks because maybe riding horses and riding bicycles have some shared characteristics. And if we can exploit such shared characteristics in this task, we might be able to do better than just learning individual tasks separately. Um, in meta learning, so in multitask learning, there are a lot of approaches such as model-based approaches, uh, which use shared network to learn this shared characteristics or gradient-based method to find the weights between different tasks. So in multitask learning, they assume that these tasks are already known, right? So we define a set of tasks, let's say horse riding, climbing, or riding bicycles, and these are already known during training and during testing. So we actually are not inferring new tasks from data. And that's in contrast with meta learning, right? So I'm go back to this example here. In meta learning, we try to learn these tasks, let's say, uh, riding horses, hiking, but then we wanted to figure out if I have a new task, what should I do? So I need to figure out a way to quickly adapt and learn new tasks, in this case, uh, skiing. So in meta learning, we wanted to learn a shared representation, but the goal here is to quickly adapt to new unseen tasks. Um, in meta learning, there are also different categories of methods, uh, including model based like MetaNet modular network or MBITs. These are trying to define design meta learning based on models that can adapt to new tasks. Um, there's also metric based such as matching network or prototypical network and trying to figure out the similarities between different tasks using a learned metric. Um, there's also gradient based methods that have been uh, that have attracted quite a lot of attention recently. So there's MAMO and LEO and SHML. The idea here is to train a, a meta gradient optimizer to do gradient descent in the manifold of tasks. And then you can adapt to new tasks uh, in this optimization paradigm. So our work bought into the model-based approaches. We also compared with other approaches, including metric-based uh, like prototypical network or gradient-based uh, MAMO. And we found that for dynamic forecasting tasks, model-based methods seem to work quite well. So here is the uh, overview of our model. And then, so our model have uh, two components. Uh, we combine the idea of multitask learning with the idea of meta-learning. So here we define each task, each forecasting task, as some dynamics governed by a particular set of parameters. So in this case, we have different type of turbulence, different type of flows. Each flow have a different force. And then for a particular force, we define that as a task. So we feed multiple flows with different forces as input, and we use multitask training to find the shared representation across these different tasks. So that's the encoder network. And then we know that these different flows are coming from the same system. So there are some characteristics that are, that are actually the same for all the different tasks. In this case, the forces are actually time invariant. So we wanted to use a time invariant encoder network to encode the sequence of flows. And then we need to use a neural network to infer these time invariant parameters. So, so the latent variable here, Z, represents the inferred task parameter, in this case, the force. So we know this 
you know, from physics that the force actually doesn't change over time. So we wanted to use this weak supervision to encode this latent variable as a time invariant variable. So the encoder loss have three terms. The first one is the weak supervision. So we can compute the sum a proxy of the test C, right? So let's say the flow is very vibrant. We can compute the average velocity of this flow. And this average velocity can be a pretty good surrogate of the underlying force because we know the force somehow is correlated with the speed of flow moving. And then we can use that as a weak supervision to guide the inference of uh, uh, latent variable Z. The second term is a time invariance regularization. So ZCI and ZCJ represent the latent variable at two different timestamps, I and J. We want this difference between different, uh, across different timestamps to be small. So we have this time invariance regularization in the loss function of the encoder. And the third term is the regularization term to make sure that the Zs are not too crazy, the magnitude of this latent variable is not uh, ill conditioned. So that's the encoder network. Then the encoder network help us to infer the task specific characteristics, in this case, a Z variable. And then using the Z variable, we can then adapt our forecasting network according to this new task. So we feed this Z variable into the forecaster network. And the forecasting network can be anything that you like, your favorite forecasting models. In this case, we're forecasting a video. So we use a three-dimensional uh, a, a concatenation of a Conv2D model and predicting this autoregressive way. You can use any other forecasting models. But the key idea here is that we need to adapt the forecasting network using the inferred latent variable Z. But how do we do this? So the adaptation have two key components. One is the adaptive instant normalization. So the adapted, adaptive instant normalization have been used in neural style transfer literature to control the generative models according to a particular style. Um, so here we're using this idea of adaptive instant normalization to adapt the forecaster according to different characteristics of our dynamics. So different uh, you know, coefficients of different parameters in the dynamics or different initial conditions or different boundary conditions, in this case, different forces. So we use this latent variable Z, a uh, vector Z, and compute this linear transformation of style, uh, then generates the, the, the mean and standard deviation for this particular task, mu and sigma, and then for every training example, every instance, xi and yi, we will normalize the training instance using this predicted mean and standard deviation. So in some sense, we're using the inferred latent variable to find the reference frame of each task. And then we will normalize the data set to that uh, reference frame for individual tasks. The second technique is adaptive padding. So this is specifically designed for dynamical systems to account for boundary conditions. So again, we have this latent variable Z. We pass the Z into a linear layer. So this is a fully connected network. And then we will use this fully connected network to compute the boundary conditions and then pad that around the prediction of our forecaster. So this computed boundary condition essentially resembles the adapted boundaries learned by our model. So these two techniques combined can uh, basically are the key components of our adaptation. So uh, we also proved in our paper the benefit of uh, using multitask learning rather than single task learning. Specifically, we can show that uh, multitask learning, uh, the single task learning, have a certain Radma complexity, which is the number of, you know, it resembles the complexity of the functional class. So this is compared with the single task learning, Radma complexity. We can see that compared with, the, if we compute 
learn each task separately and then compute the average of individual tasks. By the properties of random complexity, we can show that multitask random complexity improves upon the bond, the bound of individual tasks. So that shows the benefit of multitask learning. We can analyze the generalization error of this method. So our method basically have compute components. So one is the forecaster, the other one is the encoder. So the encoder will encode the task specific data and then perform task inference. Then the forecaster will use the inferred latent variable specifically to the task to adapt and forecast accordingly. So therefore the test error also have this component built in. So this is the total test error, which, which uh, characterized how the prediction error differ, prediction differ from the ground truth. And they have two components. F of theta is basically the forecaster. G of phi is our encoder. So this error have these terms. The first one is related to error of the encoder because we're trying to um, predict, infer the task using the encoder. And then we have the forecast error. And the, again, if you have a better encoder or you have a better forecaster, the total error will be reduced. On top of that, we have the adaptation error, which characterizes how these tasks are different. Uh, intuitively, if you think about multitask learning or uh, domain adaptation or meta learning, if a new task is somehow very similar to the existing task that we have learned from, then it's a rather easy problem. But if the new task is very far away from the existing task that we have trained on, then it's a quite challenging task, right? It's very similar to how humans learn new skills. And this type of adaptation error can be characterized as a Wasserstein distance behind all these means of the task. So here, mu is the mean of the distribution of uh, each individual task, in this case, different dynamics. And then we can compute how this new task is different from the average of the existing task we can train on. And the Wasserstein distance is the measured, is the distance on the measure space, uh, defined and uh, characterizing the similarities or rather the differences between these dis distributions. So this basically characterize how this entire pipeline of uh, meta learning is related to different components on our model. And then now I can show you some experiments of our model diet or dynamic adaptation network compared with other models in meta learning. We experimented on this the benchmark data set of turbulent flow forecasting, sea surface temperature forecasting, ocean current prediction, et cetera. These are standard data sets in spatial temporal forecasting, especially for physical dynamics. So we compared it with a, a large number of baselines uh, we included a video prediction baseline. So these are baselines designed for video prediction without adaptation. And then we also use the physics guided deep learning models. So like the va variable separation network is another physics guided deep learning method. For meta learning methods, we compared with modular tension network. So this is the, one of the state art method for uh, model based meta learning. Uh, modular, uh, there's some other modifications of model-based uh, meta-learning methods like modular weighted attention, meta-network, and MAMO, which is a gradient-based uh, network. So here is the prediction performance uh, comparison. And then the different rows represent different models. Different columns represent the different uh, data sets. So we also tested two scenarios for each of the data sets. Um, there are two scenarios of generalization. So one is the generalization to different initial conditions. So we call it future. But essentially, our data sets are generated using different uh, timestamps as initial conditions. So when we make prediction into the future, then this represents extrapolation region. So we call it the future. And the different type of uh, physical parameters. So this is a second generalization scenario where we call it domain. So domain means the flows of different uh, forces. Or uh, for sea temperature, we actually tested the scenario where we test a model on different locations on the Earth. Um, so here we can see that um, for all the models, uh, compared with all the models, our model plus some different variants of the forecaster 
have the best performance. And then for a physical um, metrics for ocean currents, so we measured the RMSE, so the lower the better. But on top of that, we also measured the energy spectrum error. So this is a metric for physical consistency. And again, we can see that um, the gradient-based method, MAMO, actually does not perform very well, well for this uh, continuous forecasting tasks and in meta learning. And then the meta model based methods in generally perform quite well. So the ResNet or uh, UNet, these models are not meta learning models and they have huge error because they are not able to generalize to different initial and physical parameter scenarios. And uh, our model diet, once it's coupled with this forecaster, it can adapt to the changes in the distribution and therefore make accurate predictions. So um, another benefit of this model is that it can allow controlled generation of different uh, parameters. So in this case, we now have a model that can take different type of flow of arbitrary parameter setting and then synthesized as we desire. So for example, here we have the flow of buoyancy force at night and then diet is our model. We wanted to emulate the dynamics of the target on the left. So you can see that the model now can simulate the flow in a relatively steady state. But then in, in some other situations, we want to control the generation of flow to a much different um, parameter regime. In this case, flow equals 21. So we can allow the model to infer this new parameter regime and corresponding to F equals 21. And you can see that it generates quite realistic flow compared to the target on the left. In contrast, other baselines like modular based weight attention or ResNet, it does either generate flows with some weird artifacts or it completely fails and generates very blurry predictions. So we also compared and uh, conducted some ablation study of our method. So in this case, so we wanted to figure out um, how the contributions of the different terms in the encoder loss play a role in our model. So we have uh, you know, three terms in our encoder model, right? The, um, the super weak supervision using surrogate of the parameters, the time invariant loss, and the, the actual regularization in terms of magnitude. So here's the ablation R model. We can see that um, uh, you know, diet is our model. If we do not have an encoder, then the performance degrades. If we do not have adaptation padding, the performance also degrades. It seems that the, the majority of the contribution really comes from this adaptation part. So if we don't have an encoder to adapt, then the model will have a huge generalization error. We also compared, so we train our model in a two-step fashion. So we train our encoder first, and then we train the forecast, and then we train, uh, fine tune them together. So we also compare the training these two things as end to end, and that doesn't give uh, as good of a performance of training these two models separately. And in terms of the encoder loss, um, as I promised, if we don't have you know, the time invariant terms, so we only have the weak supervision, right, which tells the model sort of what the task is, then the performance is not as good as using the time invariant symmetry. But once we have this weak supervision and time invariant symmetry, but if we don't have the magnitude regularization, um, it sometimes have a yield conditioned behavior. In terms of alternatives to adaptive instant normalization, in, in fact, the in style transfer literature there has been a lot of ways to use the, the latent variable Z and change the predictions. So people have come up with ways to either concatenate the latent variable to the input of the forecaster, which are called concat, or use the latent variable Z as the kernels in the convolutional neural network. So that's a kernel generation. Or you can concatenate the, the latent variable Z to the hidden states of the forecaster. That's called concatenating the hidden H. Or you can basically simply just sum up the latent variables Z with the hidden states. That's sum. 
And then maybe you can also use the latent variable as a bias term to the convolutional layer. So assuming that this task parameter is additional bias you can use in the forecaster, that's a bias. But it seems that using adaptive instant normalization essentially to renormalize the data set according to the new reference frame defined by the latent variable seem to be the most effective solution for adaptation. Okay, to conclude, I talked about this new work of ours published on NeurIPS called Dyad, Dynamic Adaptation Network. So it's a model-based approach for meta-learning, specifically designed to forecast the physical dynamics. The key idea here is that we use an encoder to infer the time invariant task parameters and the forecaster to adapt and forecast the dynamics. And then we use the idea of weak supervision to guide the learning or the inference of a latent variable uh, indicating different tasks that allows a way to incorporate additional domain knowledge in our model. We can show that this model has superior performance on turbulence prediction and real world ocean temperature current forecasting test. Uh, this work is limited to like only graded data. So in the future where, excuse me, to explore other non-graded data, let's say flows on the graph or on the spherical data, and that to be done as a future work. So you can find the code and the paper on my website or follow me on Twitter for some recent updates from our group. And here are the funding agencies for supporting this work. Thank you. Thanks for that great talk. Um, are there any questions from participants or the uh, people in the webinar? You can add those in chat or Q&A. Maybe I can get started with a question. Um, so, my understanding is that some of this, you know, the, the goal of meta learning is, you know, you motivate it with this problem of distributional shift. Um, to what extent does the system, does the encoder representation learning uh, depend on the diversity of the input from the simulator? Is there kind of, did you have a sense of, or in your experiments, uh, a necessary or sufficient level of diversity in the input for the encoder to learn a multitask suitable representation? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, so I think uh, the diversity depends on the, you know, extrapolation of the task. So if the task, so in our case, for example, in, in this part of uh, sea surface temperature, which is a real world data set. So we basically take um, patches of uh, sea temperature observations across the equator. And then we sample uniformly along that to have a good sense of uh, sea temperature in the entire domain. Um, and then in general, I think, yes. So if the new task is significantly different from the existing task, then it's a much harder task. Um, so the diversity of the training task, therefore, need to adapt in kind of need to be designed correspondingly. And I guess the, the follow on is, do you have a, an intuition on how that might be done? Or you know, one thing that we've seen and is kind of an interesting phenomenon is sometimes adding data can hurt, right? That adding something that you know possibly is a distractor in the wrong way might skew the encoder performance. So what are your kind of maybe not results, but intuitions on how to actually do that selection um, of, of the, the task? Uh, so we're, I guess, in, yeah, we're not selecting the tasks. So we assume that we're given the training task. So these are the data that we already given, right? And uh, and then you know, in the real world scenario, like if we have that much data, we always use it. Uh, we haven't seen cases where adding data from the same kind of a domain, you know, kind of regular data, not anomalous data, right? Uh, can hurt the performance. But I guess if there's in some application where the data is super noisy with not of anomalies, then yes, then that might be a very different uh, task, a problem that I don't know how to solve. Then maybe you do yeah. some anomaly detection first. Thanks. Uh, sure. Other questions?
Okay, great. I guess that, uh, you know, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me or email our team. We're more than happy to discuss with any follow up thoughts or ideas. Hey, right, thanks a lot. Or oh, there is something. Oh, sorry, there's one question. Yeah. It seems that adaptation happens through the encoding state. What if the system idea requires a long period of dynamics? Oh, the adaptation, no, it doesn't happen in the encoding state. The adaptation happens in the forecasting state. So maybe I didn't explain that correctly. Uh, so then you can see that Z variable here is the, the latent, like the task latent variable we use to adapt, but the actual adaptation happens during the forecasting step. Or I'm not sure whether that answers your question. What if the system ID requires a long period of dynamics? Again, we're not doing system ID here because um, you know, system ID requires you know the you already know the set of uh, basis in the differential equation. Here we don't have the actual governing equations in um, the dynamics. Uh, so we're not trying to learn the coefficients of a bunch of equations. Uh, but if you think about the problem is as a very abstractly, yes. Um, if the dynamics is uh, have a long-term dependency, right, then it is a very challenging task. Because then, you know, then in general, in our case, we use a three-dimensional convolution to encode the path. So if there's long-term dependency, then we don't have a way to encode, like in ComNet, right, you basically will have a memory and computational challenges to expand the kernel of the 3D convolution. So, um, so there are some work using kind of memory-based or like attention mechanism to increase the, the, the length of temporal horizon, the temporal dependency to memorize a long period of time. So you can use that in the encoder network as well. Um, I think in general, like this framework itself, it should be quite general. The actual model architecture in this framework can be quite flexible. I hope that answered your question. Uh, with the recent development diffusion models, what do you think will be the challenge by adapting these approaches in diffusion models whose training is also governed by differential equation? That's an excellent thought, actually. We are actually working on that right now. Um, yeah, one challenge is that there are different type of dynamics happening. One is the physical dynamics that we want to learn. The other one is the dynamics of generative models. In this case, the Langevin dynamics of diffusion models. So sometimes these two dynamics can couple, right? Because when you train a sample from the model diffusion model, then you, you know, when you add noise to it or using different kind of data, this degradation scheme, you change the dynamics of your diffusion model, and that will affect the prediction. Because when we do long term prediction, when we do multi step prediction, and we use the prediction as input to the, to the model, then the underlying physical dynamics can kick in into the diffusion model. So that's the, dif that's the difficulty. Uh, we are seeing that difficulty in our current project. But the benefit, obviously, is that. Because the diffusion models are also governed by differential equations, and then these differential equations can be informed by the physical dynamics. So we actually showed that using this in physics informed approaches from the underlying dynamical system can improve the diffusion models in sampling for long-term prediction. Uh, yeah, we're happy to share the paper once it's out. Well, thank you for the talk. Would it possible to replace MD simulation by using the forecasting. Yes, yes, I think in general, maybe possible. Uh, so if you wanted to build a deep surrogate models for molecular dynamics, then um, you can replace the forecaster with some other predictions. So, um, so in general, you wanted to basically model multi-agent interactions in forecaster network, but then you need to use a different forecaster network. Um, so the, I think, yeah, we also tried a little bit about the molecular dynamics, but it's very challenging because of stochasticity. Um, so if you have, uh, uh, better ideas of uh, how to do that so with forecasting, uh, maybe I'm, I'm happy to take a look.
Um, yes, hold on. There's another question about the, the test the system from a different domain. The learned system is like an ID. Uh, I see, yes, in that in, uh, sense, yes. Then I, I think that's an interesting way to interpret this. I ask a question because in certain dynamics, the molecular dynamics, you need a very long simulation to probe the meaningful observables. Uh, it's true, it's, you need a very long simulation, but but a lot of times this, uh, people assume Markovian, right? It means that uh, your next uh, observable are only dependent on very few observations in the past. Um, so this kind of Markovian assumptions in molecular dynamics can help in, in that regime. Uh, I was thinking about different problem where you know the actual dynamics have long-term dependency, so that that's a different problem. Uh, simulated the time course model for molecular dynamics with geometric machine learning. That sounds like a very interesting paper. Thanks for sharing. I will definitely take a look. Are there models able to predict dynamics with phase transitions? Uh, yes, that's a great question. So I'm not aware of, uh, um, at least in our case, we haven't explored phase transition yet. Um, I, uh, I have seen some papers where people directly predicting the uh, exponent, uh, the coefficients in the phase transition equation, right? You wanted to basically, figure out the, the transitions, like the phase transition speed, the curvature of the phase transition. So I've seen that work from more, more like condensed matter physics, um, but for dynamics forecasting, uh, I'm not aware. But great thought. I think that's a very interesting direction. All right. Uh, I assume that's uh, all the questions and that's a lot for the questions and the uh, suggestions. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have other final uh, for follow-up questions. Yep. Thanks so much for giving this really exciting talk. And uh, as you saw, a lot of people are excited about this line of work and uh, very a lot of interesting new directions. So we're very happy that uh, you're here. And yes, everyone, please uh, feel free to reach out uh, for other questions. Great, take care guys. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye-bye.